Okay. okay, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so this is a basic pro approach to mechanical ventilation. I'm going to also discuss a little bit about oxygen therapy because as we've seen, the biggest issue in these patients is mainly oxygenation. Um, so I'll be covering a bit of approaches to giving your patient the most amount of oxygen before you can get them on a ventilator as well. So welcome everybody. And just another reminder, please remember to mute your, uh, your phone or your computer's microphone. So if it's okay, we'll get going. Sorry. Okay. So just a little easy start. We should not be too fearful of ventilators because as you can see from back in 1550, oh, sorry, I see someone can't hear me. Is anybody else having trouble hearing me? No, we can hear you very clearly. Okay. All right, so back in 1555, Vesalius discovered if he cut a hole in someone's trachea and just put a reed in blue into it, the lungs would rise and the heart would become strong. Sorry, just sorry, I'm having. Uh, again, so in 1555, he was credited with the first attempt at positive pressure ventilation. And then later on, we had the iron lung, which we hardly use anymore, which was first used to treat uh, gold gas poisoning and then mainly related to the polio epidemic. And the first positive pressure ventilator that started using the prototype was in the 50s. So just to come back to ventilators and what they can do and what they can't do. So to me, there's sort of two sides to the respiratory system. There's one part that works with ventilation, and that's the brain that tells you you're supposed to breathe. There's the nerves that carry the messages to the respiratory muscles that work to move your rib cage during breathing. So the bottom line is ventilators can do this part of the job of the respiratory system very well is really, it's just like a bellows. Sorry, just another reminder to mute your um, So ventilators do this part of the job really well, but the other important part of the respiratory system is what I call the functional lung unit. And that's the alveolus and the capillary. So the heart brings the blood to the lungs and it picks up oxygen and you expire CO2. So damage to the lungs involves damage to this system, and this is where ventilators don't do as good a job, but we'll show you some of the tricks that we can do to try to improve this or stop it from getting worse. So just again, like my diagram showed, you can think of the respiratory system as having two inputs, the deoxygenated blood from the heart, the inspired air that you bring out from the outside, the within the lungs exchange of these two important things take place. Oxygen gets put into the blood and you expire cardiac, you expire carbon dioxide and at the end of it, you have oxygenated arterialized blood and expired air. Well, what did you do? Sorry, so just to get into how we deliver oxygen. So at the sort of the least sick patients, we can go with just nasal cannula and we have the different degrees of flow or our amount of flow that you can deliver. Above five to six liters via nasal cannula, patients tend to find it extremely uncomfortable and that's why we don't go much higher than that. So with a face mask, when you start needing more oxygen, 
you see there ends up also being a bit of a reservoir system. And then as you go further down to try to deliver more oxygen, you start using a rebreather bag or some sort of system that has a reservoir in it. And this becomes important in trying to prevent dilution of the oxygen that you're delivering. So if someone is incredibly short of breath, they may be breathing at 100 liters per minute flow if they're really pulling hard. If you're only giving five liters of oxygen from your system in the wall, then what happens is it gets really diluted down by the 115 liters of room air that you're mixing it with. When you provide a reservoir, essentially when the patient wants to pull flow faster than what you're delivering, then they can pull a, a supply of oxygen from that bag. If you've ever heard the term double flow, I, it's essentially each flow meter off the wall can deliver a maximum of 15 liters per minute. If you, y, if you take two flow meters and have a Y connector, then you can give 30 liters off the wall. So remember, flow is important in people who are breathing very rapidly, who are dyspneic. Uh, if you're not breathing very rapidly, then the actual FiO2 you get may be higher, even with what looks like a lower flow of oxygen. It really depends on how much you're diluting the oxygen that we're giving you from a wall system or from the reservoir with how much you can take from uh, and train, as we call it, from uh, ambient atmosphere. So I'm going to mention high flow nasal cannula, although there are some infection control concerns about using it. Um, so remember I said patients get very uncomfortable if you use nasal cannula with a flow of more than about five or six liters. But this is a system which applies a lot of humidification and they can actually deliver, depending on the system, flows as high as 50 liters per minute. Patients tolerate it a bit better because it's not covering their face. And because it's such high flow, it, it decreases the amount of dilution of room air. There's different systems that can uh, deliver it. Um, this is the system we actually use at the chest. It's a very portable system um, and allows patients to be moved with it because it can work on a battery. Um, just a bit of the physiology. We also think besides delivering high F FiO2s and decreasing the amount of dilution, it also allows a bit of washout of the, your air that's in your upper airway that may have a higher CO2. And some of these other things that I've listed here are ways that it's thought to make it easier for the patient to breathe. And it may apply a bit of PEEP as well. So there've been a lot of concerns about using it in that it may cause dispersion and aerosolize the virus. But actually, the studies seem to suggest that it's better than a Venturi mask and better than a nebulizer mask. But even nebulizers, although they nebulize particles, um, essentially, um, there is some literature saying that the particles that it nebulizes are the clean stuff from the nebule and not necessarily the patient. So in fact, the UK guidelines don't say not to use it, but all of the North American guidelines right now were not providing nebulized therapy. Now, just to come back again to using high flow, which has been used, but in, in China, um, but we're sort of recommending not to use it now, this is what the Chinese did. Essentially, they, whenever they did use it, they also placed a procedure mask over the patient to limit the risk of any spread in that way. So these are all ways or things to think about to give as much oxygen as you're uh, uh, able, to, able to before you have to call the ICU to try and come and put the patient on the ventilator. Again, just to add this, um, so this is a picture of a non-rebreather mask. But this is a special one that allows you to put a HEPA filter uh, 
at the end of the bag to decrease the risk of uh, aerosolizing viral particles into the atmosphere. So this is, uh, has a reservoir. So when the patient is breathing in, if they're breathing higher flow than what's been delivered by this tubing, there's a source of oxygen here that they can also take from to decrease the amount of dilution that's going to come from the air around because it's not a closed system. Okay, so just to go on, again, coming back to how you can make that lung unit work better uh, in terms of improving oxygen getting into the lung. So the top curve I have there is an example of someone breathing normally. So you create a negative pressure on inspiration, air flows into the lung, you get to end expiration where the pressure in your lung is equal to atmospheric pressure, then you make an effort and you push the air out of your lungs. So your lung fills up, your lung empties. Now, your lung empties as long as the pressure in your lung is higher than atmospheric pressure. So when there's no longer a pressure difference between the inside of your lung and the outside, there's no longer any flow. So how does putting you on a, how does putting a constant positive pressure at your airway help in terms of oxygenation? So one way to think about it is that you breathe in, and when you exhale, instead of emptying completely, you have some air trapped in your lung that can't get out. So when you start the next breath, you're starting from a higher volume. So that end expiration, you're usually at what we call functional residual capacity. So if you would think that my FRC or functional residual capacity is two liters, and I put a positive pressure at my mouth, at end expiration, I might go to 2.1 liters. So if I'm taking a tidal volume of 500 cc's and I start off at two liters and I go up to 2.5 liters on a normal breath, if I have a positive pressure at my mouth and my starting point is 2.1 liters, I go from 2.1 to 2.6 to 2.1 with every breath instead of going from two to 2.5. So essentially what putting a positive airway pressure uh, that prevents me from exhaling completely allows me to breathe at higher lung volumes. And if I'm breathing at a higher lung volume, then the assumption is my alveoli are bigger or my lung are bigger, lungs are bigger, so I have more surface area for gas exchange to take place. So if I have disease processes that make my lungs, uh, my alveolar smaller or tend to collapse them, by putting a positive pressure, the hope is I can recruit more of those lung units that I show you and be, showed you before and help improve uh, oxygen moving across uh, the surface area. Because an important thing in gas exchange is the size of the surface area that you have for the oxygen to move across the alveolus into that capillary. The other benefit of PEEP is hopefully to make it easier to breathe by improving the compliance of the lung. So I'll show you. So the next picture is what we call the pressure volume curve of the lung. And if you think of blowing up a balloon, when you start blowing up a balloon, it's initially very hard, and then it gets easier all of a sudden. And then if you blow too hard, it gets too much, the wall of the balloon gets really stiff and eventually pops. So when we have lungs that may be stiff, if we give them a positive pressure and increase the resting volume, what we're hoping is that the lung is being placed on a more uh, compliant part of the uh, pressure volume curve of the lung. So if there are lung diseases that make the lung stiff, if you blow it up a little bit, then maybe that can help make it easier to breathe. And if you're using a ventilator, hopefully you use less pressure on the lung and you may be less likely to uh, injure it. 
So I'll come back to that when I go through ventilators, but just to remind you again, because we're moving on to ventilators, ventilators are pumps. They apply a pressure and help you push air into the lung and you push it in under pressure and then you stop the pressure and then under the recoil of the lung or the tension that's been built up by inflating the balloon, just the same way you let go the, a balloon after you've blown it up, it empties. So essentially the machine pushes the air in and then it stops pushing and then the lung empties out. So again, a very simplistic diagram. If, we, if I start off with my tiny balloon, I push, my balloon gets bigger, I push some more, it gets bigger, I stop pushing, then it deflates back down. Just to be a little bit more uh, physiological, how much pressure do you need to inflate that lung? And it depends on two things. If you think of it instead of a, just a balloon, but a balloon on a stick, you have to overcome the resistance of the stick or the pipe. And the amount of pressure you need will depend on the resistance of that tube and how fast you're pushing the air in. So you're going to need more pressure if there's more resistance in the system or if you're pushing the air in very quickly or at a high flow. Then the other component of how much pressure you're going to need to inflate the lung will be how stiff the lung is and how much air, how much you want to fill that lung. So the more volume you want to put in, the more pressure you're going to need. The stiffer your lung is, the more pressure you're going to need. So we refer to this as the equation of motion of the lung. So the amount of pressure you're going to need to inflate a lung will depend on the resistance in the lung, the how fast you're pushing the air in, how much volume you want to put the into the lung, and how stiff the lung is. We, do, we try as much as possible to limit the amount of pressure that we're using because the concern is if you apply too much pressure, on the lung that you will potentially damage it. And that's one of the things we use in trying to determine how we're gonna ventilate patients. So one of the things you'll hear a lot about protecting the lung from injury with a ventilator is the plateau pressure. So if you remember what I said, if I'm pushing air into the lung, after the breath is completed, I'm gonna see a positive pressure at the end of the breath. There's two components to that maximal pressure. This part, which is the part to overcome resistance, and this part, which is the distending pressure of, of, on the lung. We try to keep this plateau pressure or distending pressure less than 30 centimeters of water. So the dis there's a little caveat to that though. So when you think of the distending pressure on the lung, there's what you push in. And what we're really worried about is the stretch on the alveoli. If you have a big heavy chest wall, then you can think that the ventilator has to push harder because it's not just opening up the lung, it's also pushing up the chest wall and pushing down the diaphragm. So although we look at that plateau pressure of 30, remember it may not necessarily reflect the pressure that the alveolus is seeing that we're trying to protect. The actual pressure may be lower if you can think of it as a big hand on the other side pushing down on the alveoli and not allowing it to descend as much. So again, coming back to the PEEP issue, like I said before, we call it PEEP when it's on a ventilator. I told you CPAP before, because this is a patient, when, it, when we use the term CPAP, it's a patient breathing on their own with just a constant positive pressure on the airway. When you're using a ventilator, you can think of it as two pressures if you're using PEEP. So you push the air in, and then after you push it in, you inflate the lung with each breath, but instead of deflating all the way down to the smaller balloon, you only let it deflate down to the mid-sized balloon that I have there. So then the distending pressure on the lung or the working pressure 
is only this small arrow here instead of this big arrow at, that you see at the top. So when I said it might be protective to use PEEP and we use it a lot in patients with uh, severe hypoxemic respiratory failure or ARDS or in the COVID lung, essentially we're trying to inflate the lung using the smallest amount of pressure possibly. We're trying to use PEEP to keep it open so we can oxygenate better and also uh, decrease the pressures that we're using or the swinging pressures on each breath on the lung. So you as the doctor, you have to write an order for the respiratory therapist to set up the ventilator for your patient to use. So these are just basic orders that you will be required to write. You need to say what respiratory rate you want. You need to say what tidal volume you want. And I've just put average numbers that you're, you will be writing on your ventilator settings. It's recommended that you keep the tidal volume between four and eight mLs per kilo as a protective strategy for the lung. Just think of it, you don't want to blow the balloon up so much that you pop it or injure the walls of the lung. The respiratory rate, well, that has to do with the amount of ventilation you want to provide. So a normal minute ventilation for a normal person at rest is around five to eight liters per minute. If you're running up and down the stairs or running very quickly or doing exercise, you, you can have minute ventilations up to 100 liters per minute. Most ICU patients are in the range of 10 to 15 liters per minute maximum and maybe even lower than that. So you are, when you order a rate and a tidal volume, together you are ordering the minute ventilation that you're delivering to the patient. The range of PEEP values that we use on sick patients range between five and 24. We just about never use zero PEEP unless a patient's hypotensive and then we'll re resuscitate the patient and then increase the PEEP. The average amount of PEEP I've seen on most of the COVID papers out there has been in the range of 10 to 15. What I've included on this slide is a recipe that's recommended to be used for managing your patient. So essentially, the more oxygen the patient is on, the more PEEP you are likely to need to help improve oxygenation. So this is a bit of a recipe which um, may not necessarily be the best way to do it. And in fact, there was no difference in the study overall in outcomes. So if you look, there's two levels. The control group um, needed was given lower values of PEEP and the treatment group was given higher values of PEEP. But what we're really trying to do in terms of protecting the lung, if we go back to that pressure volume curve that I showed you before, what we're trying to do with the ventilator is use enough PEEP and a low enough tidal volume that we're working the lung in this steep part of the PV curve. So a recipe may not, just based on the oxygen, may not necessarily fulfill these physiologic principles, but that's kind of what we do, but just that you know, this is what we're really trying to do. Just again, a bit of terminology with the ventilator. So there's a lot of terms here, but if you think about it, if you're trying to help a patient breathe, you need the ventilator to know when to push the breath in. The term for that is trigger and we can, and how sensitive the, the ventilator is to the patient because you want the breath coming when the patient wants it and not when they're trying to expire. So ventilators all have some system to know that. You don't usually need to worry about that. The respiratory therapist takes care of it. The tidal volume, so you can either write an exact volume depending on the mode, or you can say, give the patient this amount of pressure, and then you'll see what tidal volume the patients get. We're not using that early on in patients with COVID. Usually we're deciding we wanna control how they breathe. 
when you use the pressure modes, you give a bit more control to the patient. So we're, we'll come back to that. But to keep it simple, you just use a mode that you order the rate and you order the tidal volume. Then how fast you deliver the volume, that's the flow, which again is usually sorted out by the respiratory therapist. And then what else does the, need, the machine needs to know? It knows when to stop pushing in the air, and that's the terminology, the cycling of the ventilator. So this is just a pattern, if you want, of the most basic type of ventilation that I always use when I want to start things off and I want to keep it simple and I want to be in control. So volume controlled ventilation. So with this, so you may heard the term uh, VCAC, which is volume controlled ventilation. There's different terminologies, but it's really the best way to think of it is assist control. And essentially what it is, every time the patient makes an effort, the patient is assisted with a controlled volume and that's the volume that you told it to give. Now the top bar is the flow. Now, when you breathe in normally at the beginning of the breath, the pressure difference between the inside and outside is the highest. So the pressure gradient is the highest. So the flow is fastest. As your lung fills up, the gradient between the inside and outside uh, uh, decreases. So your flow decreases over time. So all machines now essentially work in this methodology where it has some a logarithm, so you get the highest flow at the beginning of the breath and it decays over time. We do, one of the reasons that's done, it's to mimic normal breathing and also to keep the pressure lower. So if you look at the next box, this is an example of someone who's been delivered the breath with a, con a, a constant flow the whole time. So one, it take, it's shorter to give the breath because 60 liters per minute, if you give, that's a liter per second. So if you give a tidal volume of a liter, it will take one second to deliver it. In this one, it might be a liter per second at the beginning of the breath, but it, it keeps decaying. So in this, it takes longer to give the breath than here. And you look, if you look at the pressure waveform, the pressure is somewhat higher. So we like giving the breath a bit longer. The idea is the more time there's a positive pressure in the chest, you might be able to sort of recruit those alveoli that are sticky and slow and get more air into them. And so typically the first set of curves are what you're gonna see, the flow, the pressure, and this is just uh, the volume. We don't usually look at this one. But one of the things for me to know, is the patient actually happy with what I'm doing and am I in control, is I like to see this flow waveform look nice and smooth like this. When I start to see bumps in it, I know the patient and the ventilator aren't synchronizing well together and, and aren't happy together. And for COVID, we're, probably what we're going to do is just sedate the patient more to keep it as smooth as possible while they're very sick. So you can tell the machine to deliver a fixed volume and let it determine the amount of pressure it wants to use for it. But the other thing you can do is say, hey, ventilator, deliver this pressure, hold it like that for a fixed amount of time, and whatever volume the patient gets, so be it. And then you adjust the pressure to control the amount of volume because you still want to work in that range four to eight mLs per kilo. It, when we were more, so we're concerned about injuring the lung either by giving it too much pressure or too much volume. So by using a pressure controlled mode, it gives you, you can say this is the maximum amount of pressure that I want the ventilator to give with these breaths or if you're giving a volumetric mode, you're saying this is the maximum volume I wanna give. So in this mode, again, you'll order a fixed respiratory rate, you'll order a pressure level that you will adjust to give the tidal volume that you want, and you'll still order the PEEP. So instead of just respiratory rate 12, tidal volume 400, 
you'll be writing respiratory rate 12 and tidal volume and uh, uh, pressure of 20 centimeters of water, for example. But for the, for the most part, for people just working with ventilators, keep it simple and stick to volumetric as much as possible. When, we're, when the patient's getting better, we often use a mode called pressure support ventilation. And this is where we allow the patient to control how they're breathing a bit more. Essentially, we deliver a, a pressure and the patient uh, makes an effort. The, the pressure is added to their effort and they get a breath. Now notice this says pressure support. And if I go back, these all say control and control. The controlled modes, you dial in a respiratory rate and the rate you dial in is the minimum rate that the patient will get. They can get breaths more often than that if they make efforts and it's synchronized with the patient. So if I, in the two previous mo in the volume control mode, if I set a rate of 12 by 500 and the patient breathes at 20 by 500, at 20, sorry, then that patient will get 20 by 500. They'll be assisted every time they breathe with a controlled volume. On pressure support, there is no rate. The rate is completely determined by the patient. You don't order a rate. You just order a pressure level. And then what we do is we progressively decrease the level of support that we give the patient as they get better. So it's more often used as a weaning mode when patients are less sick and not used in the initial phase of someone when they're just intubated or right after they're intubated. So just remember, if you see the term control, you need to order a rate. If you see the term support, you won't be ordering a, a respiratory rate when you write your orders, you'll, and you won't be ordering a tidal volume. You'll be ordering a pressure, but it, with the same idea in mind, you want to order enough pressure that the patient's comfortable, and they're getting a tidal volume in the range of which you want them to get. So just to come back to how much ventilation do patients need? So the ventilation really works to keep, blow off the CO2 that you're producing. So how much CO2 you need to blow off depends on how much you're producing. So your clearance of carbon dioxide is dependent on your alveolar ventilation or VA which is your total minute ventilation minus something called the dead space ventilation. So it's only your alveoli that can take part in gas exchange. Your large airways don't take part in gas exchange, so that's termed anatomic dead space. If you have alveoli that aren't getting any blood for whatever reason, that's also dead space. So I like to think of dead space as a paper bag if you fill a paper bag with air, the air will look a certain way. When you empty the paper bag, the air looks exactly the same as when it came in. So no oxygen will be taken up from it. No carbon dioxide will be removed from it. So it, you have to do it because you have to get the air past the large airways, but it really doesn't help you clear CO2. So dead space ventilation is any air that is moved in and out of those dead spaces in your lungs. So the minute ventilation is the, your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. Your alveolar ventilation is your minute ventilation minus your dead space ventilation. So if you're having trouble clearing carbon dioxide, it could be either because you didn't give enough minute ventilation or there's too much dead space ventilation. Because as you see from the equation, alveolar ventilation could go down if either your minute ventilation goes down or your dead space ventilation goes up. So just to write it a bit more mathematically and just to show you the effective breathing pattern, so VA is your alveolar ventilation, which is equal to your respiratory rate uh, 
times your tidal volume minus your dead space volume. So if I have a patient who I given a respiratory rate of 12, a tidal volume of 600, and the assumption is your anatomic dead space is around 150 mLs. This patient will have an alveolar ventilation of 5.4 liters per minute. If I take the same patient, double their respiratory rate, and half their tidal volume, their minute ventilation is the same, but because they're breathing their dead space 12 more times a minute, more of this ventilation is wasted. So the, 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 the breathing pattern above will be more effective at clearing carbon dioxide than the one below. So rapid shallow is less efficient, but we, we're tending to use it a bit to protect the lung, but just remember that you may have to put the rate up to 30 to get the same CO2 that you would have gotten with this uh, way of ventilating the patient. The other thing to remember that the tubing above where the ventilator separates between the inspiratory and the expiratory limb is the apparatus dead space. So if you give someone 12 by 600, they're actually alve and they have their own anatomic dead space plus the apparatus dead space, then the actual ventilation is 4.2 liters, not the 5.4 that I wrote up, up there. Um, when we're ventilating with lower tidal volumes because we want to protect the lung, one thing to keep in mind that the correlation between the carbon dioxide and the alveolar ventilation is not a straight line. So if you're starting at higher carbon dioxide levels, um, then smaller changes in the ventilation can have much bigger increases in the carbon dioxide. So it's a tool we have to be careful about because if your alveoli are filled with CO2, then there's less room for the oxygen and they'll need more oxygen when you if you're doing that. So just remember, if, so if you think about it, if I need a minute ventilation of five liters to get a carbon dioxide of a level of 40, if I half my minute ventilation, so I decrease it by half, which is 2.5 liters, my carbon dioxide will go from 40 to 80. Now from 80, if I drop it by 1.25 liters or half it, and 1.25 is a much smaller amount, this time my carbon dioxide will go from 80 to 160. So just remember when you're working at very low uh, minute ventilations, you're sort of sitting on a bit of an edge and you have to be careful with doing that. Um, so another thing you may be hearing about, and I know it's caused some concern with people, prone positioning. Essentially, for all of our times, just because it made our life easier and it seemed simpler, when we intubated and put patients in hospital beds, we say, lie on your back. Um, but when, the, when CT scans were done of patients with ARDS lying on their back, what you can see is that most of the disease or the atelectasis seems to occur at the bases, which is your, the lower lobes of your lungs, which is bigger. And the perfusion of the lung is mainly driven by gravity. So you have a situation where you're sending blood to the sickest areas of the lungs. And, there are, uh, and it's harder to get air into those because if you think of it's just a machine pushing, it's a lot easier to push the chest up than to push the back of the chest down into the bed. So what's been, if you take that patient now and flip them over onto their stomach, you've cleared up a lot of lung back here and you can improve oxygenation that way. So it's not tricky in terms of anything that you do with the ventilator. The tricky part is turning the patient in that position and making sure that their face and their tubes are safe when they're placed in that position. So I'll just show you. So this is the article. And if you look at the top line of the table, there was a huge improvement in uh, mortality in patients managed in the prone position. 
So if that's being done, typically you turn the patient on their stomach and you leave them on their stomach continuously for 12 to 16 hours a day. And I've put a link in the talk. It both links to the talk and a video as to how to prone a patient safely. Um, so this has been done a lot in the COVID patients. As I said, don't let it scare you. The machine does the same thing. The persons that it scares are mainly the nurses and the RTs and the doctors who do the initial turning and, and placing the patient on their stomach and, um, and making sure that they're safe because with the face not as easily visible and so much tubes and stuff around the face, that's where the issue comes in, just making sure that the patient is safe there. So I think that's my last slide. So I'm uh, open for questions, I guess, at this time. Uh, Dr. Yell, I thank thank you so much uh, for doing this. I think uh, uh, you know at peak, I think we had 300 participants, which uh, I think uh, uh, highlights the level of concern that uh, people have. And hopefully, we don't go the way of Milan and have uh, pathologists running ventilators. Um, but uh, I just wanted to 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 thank you while people reflect on their questions. Actually, uh, I have a question. I'm Geneviève Genet from Allergy Immunology. Um, any evidence of surfactant in the management of RDS patients like they do in the NICU? So there's no evidence in the study in adults was negative, so we don't use it. And there's definitely no data on the COVID population. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Spicer here, um, just speaking to some intensivists down in New York City uh, and in France, I've, uh, also with some reports from uh, Italy showing significant microvascular thrombi from autopsy of these patients. It seems that uh, that, that may be contributing to the uh, dead space issues. We've also seen a lot of clotting for patients who are on CVVHD and ECMO, and, and they've started to, at least at Long Island Jewish, they've started to almost prophylactically um, uh, anticoagulate patients who are uh, severely ill, intubated, and uh, going into ARDS. Any, any thoughts about this or experience with it? So one of the things that a lot of people have been commenting on is that the lungs are uh, quite compliant and yet it seems to be they get this much hypoxemia so that fits with what you're saying that you know there's the alveoli it's not hard to get air into them but the transmission of the air from the alveoli into the into the blood seems to be the problem and that would fit with uh, that um so um it's definitely something to keep thinking about. I was on, I got an email for, sent to me too with a, an Italian intensivist questioning the same thing, that there seems to be really much bigger problems with perfusion uh, ventilation than we would expect from how easy it is, at least initially, to ventilate these patients. Like they're not stiff, which is different from the typical ARDS. Yeah, that's exactly what I've heard. And it's sort of the basis for a, a clinical trial we'll be trying to put through RAB. We think this is mediated uh, at least in part by uh, neutrophil cellular traps, sort of uh, facilitating thrombus formation in the uh, microvasculature. Hi, Dr. Dial. Yes. Lauren Schweitzer from Infectious Diseases. There's a bunch of uh, questions in the chat window as well uh, that, that you may want to address. Right, so I'll start with the one I see first. Um, so when do we call uh, for help on the ward? There's actually guidelines that are put out for that. Once you're on 40%, um, 
call the ICU to evaluate uh, the patients. So what we have been doing is once you're needing 50%, so call the ICU, we bring them down, and when they're at 50% uh, or more, um, we're thinking about intubating them at that time. Um, hold on. Are there... So there's a question, are there clear differences emerging between younger patients, lung and older? I think all we know now is that older patients are more likely to die. But when I've been sort of scanning the literature on the COVID mortality, nobody's saying how many older people are actually getting intubated. So um, that's one of the things that's not clear but older patients are doing worse. Is it because their lungs are different? I don't know. I think it's more related to immune stuff. Um, there's a question, what brand of ventilators do we have at the MUHC? I think we have multiple brands, but regardless of the brand, if you just tell the respiratory therapist the rate you want and the tidal volume, they can figure out how to do it depending on, on the brand and they'll tell you what to, what depending on uh, what the, uh, the machine that they're using is. Um, so there's a question, are high, are high flow nasal cannula and rebreathers with HEPA filter available at all sites? Yes, um, I, I in fact had asked that we buy extra HEPA filters three weeks ago. Um, I think we need to, we're ordering more. High flow nasal cannula are available, but the guidelines now are not to use it. We're intubating patients first. But in my opinion, if you're, someone's deteriorating and you're That's waiting for that, you can use nasal cannula. And I would just put a procedure mask on the patient. Um, I think a lot of the questions, have I answered most people's questions that are related to ventilators? So there's one, is prone ventilation something we do in empirically or only based on CT imaging. Right now, I think we're proning patients that were having difficulty to ventilate on their back. And we're not doing CTs for that reason. Um, in fact, we're trying to limit moving these patients around the hospital as much as possible. So, um, uh, so, in fact, I, I think we're really not doing much chest CTs on these patients. So non-invasive ventilation, just to answer one of the questions, is actually a higher risk of aerosolization than high flow nasal oxygen. So I think we're going to a venturi mask, a rebreather bag to intubation in people who are uh, deteriorating. So there's a question, what about proning in non-intubated patients? In fact, I did see a paper from China suggesting that that's something that you should do. If patients are comfortable on their stomach breathing, you should consider doing that. So if patient is deteriorating on 40% nasal prongs, do we go to mask non-rebreather with procedure mask until the patient arrives? I think that should be yes, but uh, you'll probably get more guidelines on that. Essentially, put the mask on the patient. You don't need to be in the room with the mask, and then you go in with the uh, PPE. 
So do we do permissive hypercapnia? Yes, we do. If we're if that's what we need to do to uh, manage the um, to keep the patient's tidal volumes in a safe range. Sandra. Yeah. Yeah, it's Patter Gina. Uh, sorry to break in, but uh, the uh, we've been trying to get high flow uh, on the ward for people that are borderline, and if you uh, are having problems projected for the future for uh, the ICU beds, uh, will we have that available, like in our step down units and such? So I think so. We use high flow systems on the ward at the chest and the main reason is because we have respiratory therapy and it's a respiratory ward so it can be done on the ward the limits previously have been related to manpower and safety i would imagine if we get to that stage it's something that will be discussed and considered but it can be done outside of an icu setting but as I said, limits were made for safety prior to uh, this time for the rest of the hospital and having the manpower. Um, can we use an MDI if intubated? Yes. So um, did I get to everybody else's questions as much as possible? So I think, so there's a question I'm concerned about satellite dialysis unit. Can we use OptiFlow or mask with filter until we wait for transfer of patient very sick? I think if you're using any system that you're afraid might be aerosolized generating, you have to use it. Just make try to make your staff wear an N95 mask while you're doing that. There's the other, can you please comment on multiple patients on a single ventilator? I know it's been on social media and other places, I think we would want to do everything possible not to do it um, because uh, if the two patients have different compliance or whatever, then one patient may be getting all the air and not the other. So I'm not sure about that. Someone wrote about oxygen helmets. Um, I, I've never seen them here in Canada. They probably would be a good thing, but I'm not sure that we have it. I've seen a, 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 a homemade one that looked very interesting um, uh, on the internet. And uh, so I don't know if, we, I, hopefully we're not gonna get there. So there's a question, how many ventilators do we have at the MUHC? That I don't know how to answer. Sandra, can you hear me? Yes. This is Mirko Gillard, you know the Chief Plastics. How are you? I'm great, thanks. I asked a question, you might have missed it. I am in Ontario, um, the ministry has asked all private ORs outside of the um, hospitals to potentially donate their devices, their ventilators, because um, a bunch of us plastic surgeons, ENTs, perhaps some oral surgeons, there's a ton of uh, private facilities, all of which are closed presently. I'm, I'm wondering whether somebody from your level might be able to make the suggestion we would all be willing to donate our devices to increase the number of ventilators, because for sure, as we're seeing, there might be a shortage if this, uh, if the number of ventilated uh, 
well, people requiring ventilation increases. Do you have any ideas on that? So I think, of course, it's a good idea. It's a little bit out of my pay grade if I, in terms of managing at that level. To be quite honest, right now, I'm a lot more concerned about shortages of PPE than ventilators. We need a lot more PPE than we need ventilators. And I guess I, I'm hoping because Legault acted really quickly that we're never going to get to what we're seeing in Italy if we can talk to our people and get them to stay home. Okay, thank you. So is that it, I guess? Actually, I have a quick question. Um, say, for example, staff people do get sick, um, COVID positive, is it pos and they can still work, and we have a shortage of people. Um, is it possible to kind of cohort sick staff people with sick patients at the hospital so we can still do our job or do we still have to do the 14-day quarantine? I think that's a question for infection control. I'm not, I wouldn't know where to go with that. Thanks. Someone said if I had to choose bef uh, between a more accurate, either an accurate ventilator or a reliable, what would I want? To be quite honest, I, I need reliability. I don't think ventilators are as, I mean, they have a lot of bells and whistles. I just need them to be as basic as possible to be quite off, often, uh, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, so reliability is, is what I need. I don't need a lot of bells and whistles. I wanna be able to get the volume in that I want uh, uh, at the rate that I want and at a pressure that's stable. So shall we, uh, we end it now? Uh, am I still on? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much and feel free to email me with any questions. It is being recorded, I think, and it will be shared. Thank you very much.